Good evening. It is seven o'clock on a snowy and chilly evening in Independence, Missouri. I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, welcome to this Independence City Council Candidates Forum sponsored by the Independence Chamber of Commerce. I'm Jeff Fox. I'm the editor of the Examiner and I'll be the moderator this evening. On behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank the candidates for their participation and their flexibility as the weather forced this into a virtual event. I'd also like to thank the Chamber for organizing and staffing the event. Tonight's rules for the forum are straightforward. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement. Each will be given, <clears throat> excuse me, each will be given two minutes to answer each question. At the end, each candidate will have two minutes for a final statement. Uh, there is a uh, two minute box that will come up, that is up uh, to help the candidates keep on time. We will rotate question by question, which candidates will go first, second, third, et cetera. We've, I've gone over that with candidates already. Just a reminder, voters this spring, <clears throat> excuse me, are electing two at-large council candidates. The primary election is next Tuesday, February 8th. Five names are on the ballot. Those names are Marcy Craig, Bill Preston, Mike Huff, Jared Fears, Karen DeLucy. The top four vote getters next Tuesday will advance to the general municipal election in April. Candidates, let's use our time well. It is not my intention necessarily to reread every question for each new speaker, but I might jump in as needed. Of course, if you need a question repeated or clarification of conversations got a little off track, just holler and I'll happily do that. So the order in which we'll be going tonight, and we'll start this order with the opening statements, will be Bill Preston, Mike Huff, Jared Fears, Karen DeLucy, and Marcy Gray. So opening statements, we'll turn first to Bill Preston. Mike Huff, you're on deck. Mr. Preston. Thank you, Mr. Fox. My name is Billy Ray Preston. I'm a candidate for the council at large state here in Independence, Missouri. And for that opportunity, I'm grateful. The vote as important as it is, is but one part of civic engagement. Our republic, this representative democracy, requires citizens' participation. We have been put forward to formulate public policy and manage municipal resources and to do this good work in the council of an informed citizenry. Some of the best and brightest people in the world live right here in Independence. I have sought their counsel. Many have stepped forward to support and guide my campaign. More will avail their genius in the days ahead. There is much to know, learn, and fix. However, here is what I do know. One, the wisdom of the ages is, first of all, pure and full of good and quiet gentleness. This wisdom is pure, in peace-loving and courteous. Three, this wisdom allows discussion and is willing to yield to others. Four, this wisdom is full of mercy and good deeds. Five, this wisdom is wholehearted and straightforward and sincere. And six, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of goodness. These six points describe the good people of Independence, Missouri. I submit myself as an instrument of their will. I yield back, Mr. Moderator. Mike Huff. Yes, good evening. I'm Mike Huff. I'm an incumbent of the Council at Large. I was elected in 2018. I've sponsored many, many resolutions and ordinance to benefit this community. Um, I'm a lifetime resident. I've lived here my whole life. Uh, I went to high school at William Christman High School, graduated in 1977, went on to Park College and uh, started my professional career uh, from that. Um, I worked at Armco uh, for a few years and got on the city power and light. Uh, started off as a janitor in 1983 and through the years moved up to be a number two down at the power at the uh, TD, T and D distribution, uh, of power and light, uh, spent 34 and a half years there, retired in 2017, 
uh, could have went anywhere in the world, great retirement, great benefits, chose to run for office. So ran in 2018, which I was elected as council at large. Um, I live in Independence, always have. Uh, my wife lives, of course, here with me. I have two successful children also that are married. I have two grandkids. Um, I, as a kid, I grew up in a historical house in Independence and value the, uh, uh, the historical sites all across the city. Um, one of the uh, main reasons is, uh, family is the main reason that uh, I must invest in our community through public education, employment opportunities and community services for all the city. The city is so rich with diverse history and other unique economic, economical sources that we can capitalize and better promote to attract new families, families and businesses to our great city. That's all I have to say, thank you. An opening statement from Jared Fears. All right, thank you. Uh, first, I wanna thank the chamber for creating this opportunity for the citizens to hear from us as candidates and to uh, you, Mr. Fox, for your efforts in leading our discussion. My family moved to Independence in 1972. And with the exception of college, I've lived here ever since. I graduated from William Christman High School. I went to Graceland University in Lamoni, Iowa for college, and then came back to Independence to start my career. Denise and I were married in 1987 and uh, made the decision to make Independence our home. We have three children and two grandchildren and another one on the way. From 1985 to 1993, I worked for the city most of that time in the finance department. During my time there, I was encouraged to get a master's degree in public administration. I did that at KU and received a lot of valuable education on how city governments should operate. My career path changed and I went to work for my church, helping to fund the church's mission around the world and worked there the next 28 years. During that time, the church asked me to become a certified financial planner, which I did, and I have a small business that provides financial planning services. Following retirement from full-time work last April, I began to explore a long-held idea of running for city council. I grew up in a family and church that values service to others. That was also reinforced in the scouting program I was part of. So service to others is an important part of my life. That's my motivation, to provide service to our city and its residents. My top three priorities are number one, public safety, number two, financial stability, number three, economic development. And I hope we have an opportunity to further explore these in our discussion this evening. Thank you. Opening statement from Karen DeLucy. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Jeff. I moved to Missouri in 1977 when I finished high school. In 1980, I adopted a job in independence and I was 22 years old. I got my JD degree in 1982 and I kept my independence job and now I'm 24 years old. One thing I noticed was I had a lot of extra time and the citizens needed some work done. So I started with the Independent Square Tax Benefits District. I did that for probably five or six years. We washed Christmas wreaths. We lighted each light on the window on Harry Truman's courthouse and we got a Christmas tree, $11,000. That's all we ever got every day. I'm sorry, every year. And that's how we spent it. And it changed the Independence Square. Everything had been just broken up. Nothing was going on. And finally people started saying, oh, look at how nice this is. And businesses came back. That was, the, that was beautiful. After that, we started talking about our youth. The youth need more than the juvenile court system. 
we invented after a year and a half the Independence Youth Court. That is an alternative for the young. If they complete their youth court, pay their work done, they have no convictions. They have no, no juvenile court action done. By the way, it's seen nationally as the best youth court. A couple extra things, oh, I'm done. I'll have to talk later. I've been busy. Cool. We'll let you come back to that. An opening statement from Marcy Gregg. Yes, thank you, Jeff. And good evening. Um, I first wanna thank the chamber for this uh, event, for allowing the citizens to get to know us as candidates. And I also wanna thank you for pivoting to this online venue in light of the inclement weather we've had, better to keep folks safe and at home. Uh, for those who don't know me, I was privileged to serve previously on the city council as first district council member. Uh, between 2006 and 2016. I stepped down at the end of that term, which was um, about a year after my husband passed from cancer. I really enjoyed serving before. We accomplished a lot of wonderful things, uh, but at that time, three of our four sons were still living at home and they needed me to be at home with them. So I stepped away from service. Our city is facing a lot of challenges right now. And we have a lot of work to do together to address some problem areas that are detracting from the quality of life in our community. We need solid, well-resourced police, fire, and health services. We need clean, safe neighborhoods with quality housing opportunities for residents of all income levels. And we need to attract job opportunities that raise our median income. The truth of the matter is none of these challenges are new or even unique to independence. Uh, these are issues that communities all across America face every day. What may, be, what may be unique to us right now is that we seem to have a council that is struggling to work together to accomplish these great things. When citizens vote next Tuesday, I hope that they will choose leaders who have experience and passion and integrity, people who have demonstrated not only the knowledge it takes to lead and set policy for a city of this size, but who also have demonstrated that they can work together with other people to meet our challenges. Thank you. All right, thank you for those statements. We'll jump into questions. Uh, and again, we'll have, we have two minute responses to each question. The first question goes first to Mike Huff and then that puts Jared Fears on deck. The first question is this, what qualities set you apart from others in this field of candidates and from the current council? And alternatively, what qualities do you have that could complement those, uh, those qualities of other people on the council? Mike. Well, I've uh, so I've been in, uh, let's see, uh, since 2019, I've introduced 28 resolutions. Uh, my, the other incumbent here has only introduced 11, um, very much into the public safety. Uh, it's not just about police fire, it's blight, mental health, hopelessness, or homelessness, uh, just to name a few. Um, there was a, quite a bit of money uh, that come in from the federal government, 20 million plus, uh, which was squandered away, uh, in my opinion, for pet projects while I introduced some uh, resolution there to use that for health services, uh, uh, for fire equipment. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a pumper truck out here, one of our fire stations that can only turn in one direction put that on the agenda to, to buy a new one. It's pretty sad that it can only go right or left and that's all it can do. Um, some technology improvements, gear training. Um, I've been talking about this uh, for over three and a half years uh, about the safety and everything of our citizens. In fact, I was laughed out in 2018 by the council that I didn't know what I was talking about. And here we are three, almost four years later, now we're in a crisis here. Um, then the uh, thing about this is also that people are not aware of is that we have, we ask, keep asking the questions of how many police officers we have uh, that we're lacking. And it's always, uh, well, the other day it was, there was three different answers. Uh, we didn't know what any of them were. So um, we're still trying to figure out how many were short. Now we've come apart, uh, come to a point where 
in the next two years, there's going to be 45 to 50 retirees that we're going to have to fill. I guess that's in the time there. The question goes to you, Jared Fears. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> so I already mentioned a little bit about some of my uh, educational background in, um, in public administration, uh, degree in business administration, um, and work as a financial planner, uh, education as a certified financial planner. And so I bring all of that to, uh, to this kind of a role. Uh, in addition to that, when I worked for the city, one of my roles was to work in the, with the budget. Um, I was, uh, my title was budget analyst. I did a lot of work with the budget. Uh, we're facing time in the not too far distant future when we're going to uh, have financial issues as a city, at least um, uh, that's the, the message that we got from the city manager a few weeks ago. And, um, and so um, I, I bring that skill set to uh, manage resources. Uh, I'm a business owner. So I understand uh, what it, it means to run a business in a community and, and be a part of that community. Uh, beyond that, I just bring a lot of years of service in through a variety of different um, uh, places. I've been in the Lions Club for over 35 years. Uh, I've worked in scouting for about 30 years. Um, I, you know, I, I um, am actively involved in scouts uh, still. I go to scout camp every summer. I serve as a SACOM in the tribe of Mikasei. Uh, so I have a lot of uh, history of uh, public service uh, or service to the public, uh, service to people. And this is just basically an extension. Now, as far as uh, complimenting other um, members, you know, I've, I've had the career of working with people of a wide variety of different perspectives and reaching common ground. And so uh, that's what that's a really important thing uh, that I bring to the council as well. Thank you. Karen Delizzi. Okay, I stopped at I was 24. Well, I continued working. Remember, it's been 40 years. So there was a problem on 24 Highway and someone wanted to do some rezoning, which really would have hurt the neighborhood. The neighborhood got together. We talked to the city, went to planning commission a number of times, and everybody reached a, a good solution. All right, that was number one. Number two, MoDOT comes in and says, okay, we decided to put a concrete barrier from 291 East on 24 Highway, about four miles. I said, wait a minute, you're killing the businesses. How are people going to get there? Answer, not my problem. I said, oh, you haven't met all of us. All of us that got together, we defeated that con concrete barrier. And then we had so much gas ass <laughs> audacity. We had the money to be put in on 24 highway as sidewalks. Next, we needed street lights. Desperately, neighborhood improvement district was the answer and we did it. And we now have 52 street lights from 291 North, about four miles. Please do not think this was done solely by myself. No, I did spend a lot of time doing it. And I learned so much with public service. At one point, I joined the planning commission. And I joined, Marcy, I think you were on with me, from 1999 to 2014, I read everything. I studied everything. I decided what was a good answer under the law, what's allowed in the charter, and I announced what my decision was with a reason. You may not agree with me, but you will know why I voted the way I voted. Thank you. The question is about what sets you apart from others in the field and on the council and what qualities you also have that might complement those of others up on the, on the council. That question now goes to Marcy Gray. Thank you, Jeff. I like this question um, because I think, and I think the secret to the question is really the second part of it. Uh, and that is what, what qualities help complement the rest of the council. I think when it comes to getting anything done in this community, uh, we have to have people who are willing to work together. 
Um, the qualities that I think I bring are the ability to, the, the proven ability to work with other people, uh, to disagree with them, to just dis disagree politely, um, to come prepared. Uh, in my previous service, um, I, like Karen mentioned with her service with Planning Commission, um, I, I think Karen and I would both agree we are the two that, that read everything, come prepared. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in making decisions, we communicate those decisions, the reasoning why. I think as my previous service, you know, ended over five years ago, almost six years ago. But during that service, we were able to accomplish a lot of good things in the first district. We built the first um, special needs or inclusive play playground, really in all of Eastern Jackson County. And that sits in McCoy Park and it includes now uh, children and families of all kinds of abilities. We held neighborhood revitalization meetings throughout my district. That was my plan to bring the, uh, the city and all of the city uh, staff in to listen to what neighbors wanted and to help those neighbors craft a plan for revitalization in their own specific neighborhoods. We were, mainly our goal with that whole project was to listen to people, to listen and to hear their concerns, to make them feel appreciated, and then to design plans that met neighborhood needs. Um, aside from that, we were also able to accomplish a lot of wonderful things, some large scale projects citywide, but we do those things by getting along. I think that's the number one quality that I bring to the council, not only my experience and passion, but the ability to listen and work with others. And finally, that question goes to Bill Preston. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, that's a brilliant question. And, and I'm certainly grateful for it. Um, first of all, I think my federal law enforcement background and the analytical skills that are necessary and all the investigations that I personally conducted and directed and my testimonies before the federal courts have prepared me for the rigors that are necessary in dealing with what is at City Hall. There is no secret. There is much to be done in fixing the city. I'm grateful for uh, Council Lady Delucci who interrogated me along with the mayor when I was vetted for going on the planning commission. And my response was substantially, if you're looking for someone who will be thoughtful, who will be deliberate, who has the academic and professional preparation to do the work and who will go about it in a fair and reasonable manner, I am your person. If however, you're looking for a rubber stamp, don't pick me. You will be grossly disappointed if you do so. I'm excited at the opportunity to go about the business of doing what I have done in public service, straightening up that which is broken. City Hall is broken. The city is in disarray. I am prepared to do what is necessary with the wise and brilliant counsel of the good people of independence. And I think that is what will really set me apart, that I will take the advice and the counsel and perspective of the people of independence, and together we will fix City Hall. Thank you. All right, this next question goes first to Jared Fears, and that, that means uh, Karen DeLucy is on deck for the second shot at this question. The question is this, what is the best path for this city to contain utility rates for citizens while using city-owned utilities to drive economic development? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, Jared. But... Yes, yes, absolutely. And I couldn't, yeah. <clears throat> Let me try to speak a little more clearly here. What is the best path for this city to contain utility rates for citizens while also using city-owned utilities to drive economic development? Jared Thank Fierce. Well, well, Jeff, the, um, the best path to contain the, um, the uh, utility rates is, is through economic development. Uh, because it's through economic development, we've, we've seen recently um, presentations to the council I've been attending council meetings since uh, May, since I first started thinking about this. And um, uh, we have um, um, 
heard that, you know, in order to keep our rates in line, we need economic development. We need more businesses. We need more houses to come into our community to keep our rates down. So um, we do need to, to uh, keep that um, we, we do need to um, have economic development. It, it will also help with fin the financial stability uh, of our city. We need a more tax base for uh, financial stability. We need to um, make better use of vacant retail space to uh, develop land as well as already developed space. Uh, I mean, the, the long and the short of it is without economic development, we will continue to struggle financially. IPL rates will go higher. Uh, infrastructure will suffer. We need to, to work on economic development. And the way that really gets done, I think, is by uh, City Hall and the council and the mayor establishing, reestablishing trust with its citizens to help um, create the opportunity uh, with, with citizens and developers to create the opportunity uh, that can be had with economic development. Uh, Karen DeLucy. You're just making me remember all that money spent by IPL that never should have happened, but did. 10 million here, 1 million there, 2 million there. And I argued against it. I guess people decided that I'm being ridiculous. And then along comes these um, cuts to the rates right by my cuff, two and then 4%. I absolutely was in favor of that. There is no way we can ask our people to carry those burdens. We have got to maintain using our money wisely. And just because it's IPL, that does not mean we can't use the general fund. Everybody talks about, well, IPL is the only one to do A, B, and C. No, it's not. We can use our best mind. We can look at the money. We can look at our people and say, okay, what are we going to do to further delete the high cost of living here? And that's going to, we need to keep great workers. Mr. Nails right now, he's there. Thank you, Lord, he's there. Before him, we had two really good people. They both left. The one before that, who was wonderful, left. There's been a lot of bad issues going on in city government. That has to stop. We need to keep people who know what they're doing, who also, by the way, go to public utility board and speak. That's all I have. Marcy Gregg, that question goes to you. And thank you, Jeff. You know, the reality is, I think we have to have some really hard conversations in the community about the future of, of IPL, um, about where we're at right now with our ability uh, to afford the costs of, of this utility and the burden that it's placing on our citizens. You know, we've, we've spent a lot of money on some really good studies by experts to tell us what has to happen in order to reduce the costs and the impact to our, our residents. And what they have told us is that we need to either grow our community by 30,000 people. And mind you, we haven't grown more than about five or 10,000 in 30 years. Or we need to add over 4,000 new commercial businesses, commercial users. Or we need to bring in 27 new industrial customers or some combination of all of those things. Uh, those are some really hard hills to climb. And I think at the same time, we have to have conversations about um, the money that was spent in the past unnecessarily. Spending $10 million to decommission a plant that didn't need to be decommissioned. And in doing so to spend more than twice the amount of the low bid on that project was wasteful, unwise, and we are now paying a price. I don't have you know, the answer to the, to the question, what do we do to make this work for the future? But I do know that we have a lot of good minds in IPL and we have a lot of expert advice already given to us 
what we need now is a council who will sit down and listen to that and start making decisions based on the best interests of our community and in running that utility truly like a business as the charter requires. Thank you. So again, the question is, what is the best path for this city to contain utility rates for its citizens while also using its city-owned utilities, all of them, to drive economic development? Bill Preston. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, you must have done this before because the, these are brilliant questions. Um, economic development is a diversified animal. There is a multi-prone approach. They're all integrated. Economic development drives a diversified base. Therefore, we have to attract entities of industry, whether that industry is industrial, uh, manufacturing, or we look at our population that is undertrained and undereducated. And if we then develop an industry to attract, address that, we would be looking at an industry, the clean industry of education. I know of a small town in Arkansas with five universities. Educating people is important. There's Kirksville with a population of some 17,000 people. And they have a medical school, a dental school, and a university. But what they also have is an engaged population that refuse to permit mere elected officials to think that they have all the answers. I again emphasize the fact, I intend to fully engage the brilliant people of independence and with their thoughtfulness, with the professional consultants that we have hired, paid, and refuse to listen to their advice, perhaps we can redirect our efforts in the direction of common sense, just plain common sense, honesty and integrity. I emphasize, I did law enforcement. I have zero tolerance for foolishness. And finally, Mike Huff, that question goes to you. Yes, um, this, uh, Independence Power and Light is owned by the citizens of this city, and uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. Um, we've been preaching this all along um, about generation and the future of Independence Power and Light. The prior councils uh, have just kicked this can and kicked this can down the road. The units out there that we have that we don't even hardly use are 60 plus years old. And uh, here we are, we have some. Uh, big decisions to make and this council that's a uh, few of them on here at this point are still trying to kick this can down the road um, you know it's hard to get uh, capital investment uh, this is a, an important part of that um, I'm just amazed um, you know I did a four percent and a two percent rate reduction I was told at that point that independence power and light would be broke in less than a year that rates were going to go up 11%. Went through that, end up with all kinds of surplus money. Went in and gave $193 to the citizens. Another one that I introduced got chastised for that by many, many council members. Um, that I was going to bankrupt power and light. Well, here, here we go. We've got, uh, I don't know, $68 million. Uh, Councilman Delucci, uh, Councilwoman Delucci introduced a thing of uh, a bill for reserves being 25 million and all of a sudden changed heart now and went up to $68 million. We've never used any reserve money in this city for the life of the reserve funds. Never have we ever used it. And now we increase it to $68 million. This is the citizens money and the charter says be refunded. Uh, we need to get this uh, generation thing figured out. It's very important to this city and it will bring the capital investment. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's stay with economic development for a bit. This question goes first to Karen DeLucy, and that means uh, Marcy Gregg is up after her. Look, every community wants economic development, and those that attract it make trade-offs to get it. For example, this community will continue to tolerate excessive truck traffic for the Unilever and cargo larger expansions, 
but was not willing to consider a degree of truck traffic for the van trust project. And that could have been a lot of jobs. When the next proposal comes to the city, what are your criteria for deciding on the trade-offs that you are willing to ask this community to make? Karen DeLucy, you're up. The first thing I do is talk to the citizens. And I'm not talking about a certain section. I'm talking about all citizens. They're in charge. All right, so what is the reason we want to do that certain development? What kind of economic industry will we receive? Where are we going to put it? What is the effect on everybody else in that neighborhood? You cannot just say, oh, good, we're going to get more money. I don't know how many CIDs or how many NIDs we have. We have got at least, what, 40, easy 40 tax breaks to people who are in business. We cannot keep doing that. We have to know what we're doing. How can we prevail? And will the city actually grow to that 30,000 people that was mentioned? That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Marcy Gregg, that question goes to you. Sure. I think, you know, I, it wouldn't be my criteria as a council member to say, um, this is the trade-off. Like Karen said, this is, a, this is about a community. And when we talk about bringing in development into an area, we are talking about bringing that into someone's neighborhood. Uh, I've said for many months now, uh, amongst those who I've talked to I've, as I've campaigned, the city leaders need to be talking with residents in the Little Blue Valley now. They need to be having conversations right now about what that next economic development project could and should look like. We have a comprehensive plan that envisioned industry in some of that area. It envisioned commercial in some areas and residents. We've built out some residential areas and now those residents have expectations about what the land around them should look like and what the impact should or shouldn't be on their homes. A responsible council and, and mayor should be out having conversations with those neighborhoods and letting them know what the comprehensive plan sees for development out there, what the potential projects are that, that the Economic Development Council and the chamber and others have been seeing come our way into the region. And then to say to those residents, what, is, what are your criteria? What is a hard no? And, and what is something that you welcome? So that when that next project comes down the hopper, they already know uh, that, that something is planned for the area and that they have some impact and they have some sense that they are in community, you know, they are concluded in the process. Um, the areas that are designed for industrial development right now ought to be very com clearly communicated to the residents that live around them. So they're not a surprise. And then I think, you know, when that communication happens, it lessens the impact on the neighborhoods and, and the criteria is set by the citizens of our community, not by one or two people up on the city council. Thank you. Bill Preston. Thank you. Again, Jeff, I applaud you on the question. Let's go back to the most fundamental thing that every civilized society depends on, and that's education. Educated police force, educated workforce, uh, let's go back again to Kirksville. Uh, with, uh, the colleges, universities, medical school, dental schools. Let's again look at our population. What, what, what does the population need? We've got 75% of our population that probably uh, qualify for public housing subsidies. So not all of industry is going to be detrimental. We, we can attract those industries if we look to our population. We've got some incredible building contractors here. I'm certain we can draw some great ideas from a council with these people. We've got educational needs. Why don't we address that? Why don't we build a police training academy? Why don't we build more universities to address? When I say universities, I don't mean just four year, but trade schools. Not every kid want to nor should go to a four year college. Craftsmen are in short supply. Laborers are in short supply 
that have skills. Again, if you want to fix anything, it starts with education. And the need is great. The opportunity is there. We do not have to pick from unwelcoming and detrimental industries that may not be the very best for the city in the long term. We can do better, but we have to be thoughtful and it has to be strategic. We can no longer do knee jerk city planning. I yield back. Mike Huff, that comes to you. The question, the premise of the question is about trade offs. You can accept or reject that premise, but that's the premise of the question. How do you walk through those trade offs, Mr. Huff? Yes, well, um, definitely citizens' engagement is the most important thing here. I think we seen that down on the Van Trust um, episode down there a couple of years ago. It was very, very poor marketing, uh, did not talk to the citizens out in that area. Um, but uh, moving forward, um, I know that myself and some other council members have met with the people down there, the citizens, and um, we actually changed the language of a business park with all the with the citizens being engaged in that uh, for the business park down there uh, zoning. So we got that all changed out uh, or changed uh, to the benefit and what the citizens wanted down there in the valley. Um, I think the main thing we need to do is to understand the benefit of the EDC. And uh, uh, as far as that, uh, the trucks and everything, I think that there's, there isn't something else that's going to happen down there in the valley. And I don't think, I think with the citizens engagement in that and they're, them talking to us about it, I think it'll be a smoother thing. Um, we just need a, a clear path uh, moving forward. Uh, we had this housing study down uh, for the whole city that's sitting on a shelf, which we figured that's where it was going to be. It's not being utilized, which is very important. The strategy and the strategic end of this down there in the valley. Um, you know, we just, uh, like I say, we need to, uh, we've lost a lot of businesses and revenues in this city, uh, a lot. And so with the pandemic and some other issues there, but, um, you know, like I say, the, the main thing that we need to do is make sure that our citizens are engaged in all of our decisions and we are transparent and we get their trust back. Thank you. And the final bite of this question goes to Jared Fears. Jeff, um, so what you're really talking about, the, the crux of the question is cost versus benefits. And, uh, and that's um, all of, and I agree with uh, some of what I've heard from other uh, candidates about listening to the citizenry, um, creating opportunity for um, for uh, citizens to have input into uh, what's in a certain area, what's going to go into the kind of business that might go into an area. Um, but uh, but ultimately, all of that comes back to building trust. And uh, we have a um, for better or worse, we have a, a council that is not trusted by uh, many citizens. I uh, hear that over and over again as I've walked uh, the community. And so um, we need a council that's going to listen to the citizens, that's going to build that trust, that's going to develop a specific criteria, and to um, bring that criteria together, depending on the type of development that's being considered to bring that together to uh, make economic development happen in in our city all right thank you we uh, could and maybe maybe arguably should talk about economic development all night but we ought to touch on a couple of things as well this is a question that goes first to marcy Gregg, and that means <coughs> excuse me that means bill preston is on deck after marcy Gregg. the question is this Independence, like cities across the country, is having trouble recruiting police officers. In Independence, officers get raises by contract and the city recently approved retention bonuses for officers. Do you think this is really just a pay issue or are there additional strategies that the city should pursue? Uh, Marcy Gregg. Well, that's no softball question for sure. I, I think the... You know, we are living in, in, in interesting times, as they say, 
where I think the, this problem isn't unique just to the police department. Um, we look all across the country and you see employers that are having a difficult time hiring and retaining employees. And the information that I've, I've really been keen to focus on lately is what, what is driving that? Is it just salaries? Because clearly people are getting raises and, and increases in pay, and yet they're still not joining certain, um, certain job forces. I don't think our police department is any, any different. I think we need to take a really strong look at their overall compensation package. We need to certainly make sure that they are being offered as much, if not more, than the, uh, the surrounding communities uh, within our means to, to, to pay them, of course, because we need to be responsible with the funds. But we also need to ask those members of our, you know, of our, our existing force, what is it that um, might entice them to go elsewhere? I hear anecdotal stories about um, better working conditions in other communities. I don't know if that's the case or not, but as a council member, I want our public safety officers, um, not just in police, but in fire and others to always be able to communicate with us uh, about working condition improvements, about non-monetary compensation. Maybe it's that they need more time off from an extremely stressful job. Um, maybe it's in the health benefit system. You know, we need to hear from them what their issues are and address those directly. Um, I think this is an issue we're facing as a nation, to be honest, all across the board. Over to you, Bill Preston. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, once again, I, I thank you for this question because it affords me an opportunity to speak to something that is dear to my heart and that's law enforcement and most especially local law enforcement. The problem is not a local issue or state issue, national issue. What we have done to police officers is unconscionable. By virtue of how we pay them, educate them, promote them, we have positioned police officers to a position that they cannot possibly succeed. There are unintended consequences when a police officer, because of economics, is forced to work 80, 90, and 100 hours or more. I investigated a university, and I found police officers who worked off duty after their 50-hour tour of duty, they worked another 50, 60 hours a week, not one week, one month, but month after month and year after year. We would never permit an airline pilot to fly an airplane 80, 90 hours a week. We would never permit an over the road truck driver to drive a truck 80, 90 hours a week. And yet we compel police officers by virtue of withholding that which is due, a just wage. But not only do we withhold a just wage, by compelling them to work 80 and 90 hours a week, we take away the opportunity for them to educate. From a point of risk management, city management, it is folly. It is absolute folly to pay an officer such a wage that he's compelled to work like that and deprive his family of him. We have to do better. It is a topic that I would love to have a protracted and more than two minutes to address. Thank you for the brilliant question. Fair enough. Mike Huff, what, what are your thoughts? Yes, um, we've seen, we've thrown some money out there and uh, we knew at that point that that wasn't the only issue. Um, like Mr. Preston says there that, you know, it's a national issue, but uh, locally uh, we have a lot of issues here. Number one, we have no police chief there. We have an acting police chief. We need to get in there and recruit someone to be uh, to understands our citizens here and it can work with the citizens. Um, the uh, another thing that <clears throat> comes to mind uh, on this is this COVID with COVID and everything. Uh, introduced this thing uh, resolution here a couple of weeks ago, uh, trying to resolve that the police and fir the first the front line people police fire are uh, they're. Uh, 
anywhere around COVID or, you know, that, that work or whatever, then they're having to use their own sick leave and vacation. They've exhausted all their time. Doesn't even mean if they're sick, they, they're sending it home for five days or whatever city policy is at that time. And they're using their own time. And so they've completely ran their times all out. Um, another problem I see uh, as far as getting recruiting, of course, is it's a national thing also, but we have to be more attractive than, than everyone else. Uh, we need a lot of training out there. Police officers love training. Uh, we need to uh, really uh, restore the, the peace up there. We need we really need to figure out our command up there. I think that it's like a loose cannon up there uh, because we, we don't have a permanent police chief. I think it's very, very important that we have leadership up there and calm the waters, um, try to get that figured out uh, sooner than later. Uh, and as far as recruiting, um, we're just going to have to get be better than everyone else and try to get people over here. Thank you. Jared Fears. So uh, everybody's in an agreement that this is a difficult issue nationwide. Uh, unfortunately, that acknowledging that doesn't really help us here in independence. Um, this is the number one topic as I that I've heard about that I've heard people talk about as I've gone door to door and listened to. Uh, what concerns our residents have. I've spent the last three years on the Public Safety Tax Oversight Committee, the last two years as chairman of that committee. And this was a really valuable time to learn how the police and fire departments operate. Um, one good thing that came out recently was that um, we, we uh, acted as a committee to uh, help uh, lead to help develop language to uh, that led to the ballot initiative in November that provided additional part of the use tax to go to the police officers. And, and this has helped uh, and it will help. It's going to take time, but um, we're still 38 officers. Uh, as of this morning, we were 38 officers down on a 230 officer uh, police force. So uh, we do have to continue to work to be competitive, uh, both in salaries and, um, and in hiring uh, mechanisms. We also need to provide opportunity for advancement in uh, our police force so that people can move up the ladder and have a career path to uh, be able to equip them to be successful in their career and make it so people want to come serve uh, as police officers in independence. One of the things I did uh, for a while when I was at the City of Independence was administer police tests and fire tests. We had, um, we had the people lined up to, do, to uh, take that test and had to turn them away. We, we need to do what we can to uh, add to the number of people that are, right, right now we can't even get enough people to uh, apply. And so we need to uh, go out and do more recruiting to do that as well. So. Those are my thoughts. Karen DeLuzzi. We just got a couple of new guys and I'm thrilled as is every other citizen in, in this town. If you ever go down there, you will see the love the citizens have for the police here. This is gigantic. In order for us to continue, we do it. We're going to MCC to see if we can get some type of education to make it a little bit easier for people to join us. And I'm hopeful it's gonna happen in the future. We did give lots of money to um, fix the police building, 600,000 alone on the firing range. We also you know, improved other things. We have added bonuses. We have added big, big raises. And we have the money that's coming in to complete their education. We have not been doing education and I've been talking about it for at least a year. Now we have the money, now we have the training, we have the good fire firing board. We can do this people. Can we get people from outside? Sure, how do I know? because we're recruiting them. The other areas in town, in the country, do not like the police. So we're going 
anywhere to say, we love you. We have this opportunity. Please come and help us. And we're getting it done. Does it happen in one day? No. Will it happen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving along reasonably well. I think we've got maybe time for a couple more questions. And so we'll start with this one. This goes first to Bill Preston, followed by Mike Huff. The question is this, what is the single best thing that the city itself can do to improve the quality of life in this community? Uh, Jeff, you may have stopped me with that one. Um, I, I confess that there is so much that can be done and need to be done. Um, independence is a queen city. It has so much to offer. I lived for a great period of my life in a town with some dilapidated cemeteries and they built an entire tourist industry around those cemeteries. I say that because we have Mount Washington uh, a national treasure. We have President Harry Truman and this legacy, the library. We are only one of 13 cities in America with a presidential library. We have to simply do a better job all around of identifying what we have in terms of our actual and natural assets. And then we have to thoughtfully go about the business of marketing. Quite honestly, I could build an entire tourist industry around Harry Truman and Mount Washington. I am not a marketing professional. I did law enforcement sometimes, and I hopefully with a good attitude, but, but always hopefully thoughtful. Uh, the city is a jewel. It has much. I don't think we can point to one single thing that has to be done, but many things that has to be done. And we have to educate our population. Therefore, I confess, education is and has always been and always will be the single most important thing that we can do in any city and most assuredly independence. Thank you for the gifted, brilliant question. Quality of life, Mike Huff. Yes. Uh... A note here. I don't understand how Mr. Fears got 38. I've been asking for two months how many officers we've been short and given three different numbers, but that's fine. Um, as far as this question, uh, I believe the most important thing here is the housing study, which I've mentioned before. Uh, it directs us on where to invest, how to invest. Uh, looks like by going through it, I've read it a couple times and went through it. Um, we've done a lot of overinvesting in on the Independent Square out on the in district three on that southeast corner has been it's we need uh single homes and not uh apartments and stuff like that uh, multifamily. um in that housing study it also talks about uh the average person what they would have to make to be able to rent one of them and it's 21 bucks an hour and i'm just wondering where we're getting 21 dollar an hour jobs in this city so um Another part of that would be public safety, which we've all discussed this evening. Public safety is one of the most important things. And uh, another important thing would be the utility costs. And, and uh, I continue to work on that and continue well to uh, work on them utility costs. Another thing out there that uh, has been mentioned a lot is the workforce development uh, to move this city forward um, with the trades uh, and talk to them about it and, and got them to, to talk to me quite a bit about that and a couple of school intent and superintendents on a career path for these uh, young ones that are coming out of high school that may, maybe not want to go to college that want to do something else so all these things weigh in for that so that's all I have thank you uh, Jared Fears quality of life yes um so you asked for a single thing, right, Jeff? I did. Okay. Well, um, we've heard a number of uh, of ideas, and and um, you know, I think as a as the city council, we're talking about the city council tonight. 
what the city council can do to, uh, uh, to increase the quality of life uh, for its citizens is to uh, create a way to increase the trust in that group, that uh, to create a scenario where the citizens trust that the city council is, has their best interest in, in, at heart. And that's by uh, acting with integrity, by being honest, being open, being transparent uh, with, our, uh, with what we do as an organization, so uh, as a city. And so that's what uh, I believe needs to happen to create an opportunity for our citizens to have uh, increase their quality of life because so much will unfold from that type of action uh, for benefit of the city as a whole. Karen and Lucy, what is the single best thing the city can do by, on its own to improve our quality of life? It's the city council. Well, the city is all, all the whole city, yeah. I know, I know. And here I'm telling you what my idea is. Yeah. Everybody on that dais, read the charter, follow the charter. Let's use study sessions to discuss very important decisions that will come in the future. Listen to our citizens. Use all those things I've just talked about and the quality of life of the citizens will become resolved and completed knowing it's being done correctly. I am telling them what we need. They're explaining to me everything. I believe it. I'm here. I'm staying. That's it. And Marcy Gregg. I think the single one most important thing we can do is to work together, citizens, city council, mm -hmm. businesses, and so forth, to make our citizens feel safe in their community. If there is one thing that I hear on people's minds time and time again, aside from transparency and accountability in local government, it's, I don't feel safe in my neighborhood. I don't feel safe in my community. If you're on Facebook at all, you see the community pages that are posting car thefts, catalytic converter thefts, businesses broken into, homes broken into. If you're in the ring network, you get this sense of what's happening in your neighborhood and expanded neighborhoods of petty crimes, things that make us feel unsafe in our community. I think the one thing we need to do is to come together as a city council of leadership as well as working with the citizens and the businesses to begin to really talk about what it is that will make our community less attractive for crime. Uh, and, and that's not just putting more police officers on the street, that's attacking neighborhood blight because blighted neighborhoods are attractive to criminals. Uh, that is dealing with an increasing population of, of homelessness in, in our community not that those folks are committing crimes, but they make people feel unsafe. And, I, and they, the homeless, are unsafe. We need to approach that comprehensively. Um, and I think we need to empower our neighborhoods to be, uh, to be able to revitalize themselves and access and work with city resources to do that. In a nutshell, all of these things are about how we feel safe and, and free from fear in our community. And I think when we begin to see that we can work together, not just as a city handing down edicts about what we'll do, but work together as a community to get that job done, that's the number one priority is we've got to feel safe in our city. This question goes first to Mike Huff, followed by Jared Fears. The question is this, companies need employees. Employees need to get to work. For many folks, that means taking the bus. Do you favor a more robust transit service within independence and one that is more deeply integrated with the overall metro-wide system. Uh, Mr. Huff. Yes, uh, this has kind of been a hot potato for since I've been on the council. It's uh, very, very expensive to the city, but I do believe that we need it and we need to do everything we can to keep that going and we need to expand it as much as possible. Um, I hear all kinds of different numbers, but um, 
you know, these are citizens of the city and, and a lot of them don't have vehicles to get to their jobs and stuff and the store. So I'm definitely in for expense, but I do realize it is expensive. Jared Fierce. So as I drive the uh, streets of, of our city, I see folks at the bus stops on a regular basis uh, waiting for, for their, um, the bus. And lots of times they're in the rain or they're in, you know, unclement weather. Uh, and so, yes, we do need to have a transit system that provides opportunity for everyone to be able to tra get transportation to their um, place of business, to the stores, to the places that they need to go. Um, and, uh, and that's really important. As much as we can afford that, it is what we need to do. Uh, it, it is an expensive proposition and it it's even gets more expensive as you try tying it into the broader metropolitan area but uh, but that is important for our people to be able to get you know get from one place to another where they need to go to uh, conduct their their business of their lives Karen de Lucy that question goes to you yeah we've had a problem with the bus buses Throughout the years, we've lost money. And because we've lost the money, we had to take, for example, the six o'clock bus off. So the next bus is five and we don't run on Sunday. So what we've been doing is number one, seeking more money to help us pay the bill for the bus. It is extremely expensive. We have tried to find federal money we have gone to the Kansas City transit people and see if they could give us some money. Last year, they gave us $400,000 for it. We thank them very much. We kept the bus going. I wanna make it so we make it after five, maybe even six or seven. And why not one, one move on a Sunday so people can go to the grocery store and not walk two blocks. Thanks. Uh, Marcy Gregg. This is an issue I can get passionate about. Um, yeah. And when I served on the council before, this was an issue that I championed. I served on the Mid America Regional Council's Total Transportation Policy Committee. Um, I worked very closely with our friends at uh, Kansas City ATA um, back then in trying to figure out ways to expand service. Um, while I was on council, we did do an expansion. We ran some routes down south of I-70 and, and the problem we run into is the cost. It's always about the cost. I give props to the director um, of KCATA, Robbie Mackinnon, for his efforts to bring national attention to this service, um, to, to also partner with us out here in Independence and make us part of one big family. Uh, even right down to branding, uh, we changed the branding from the KC Indie Bus to, you know, uh, Casey Ride, uh, and we're part of that big family that helps us with economy of scale. But as Karen and others have already said, it is a huge financial problem every time we try to expand services. That said, uh, I will tell you that my dad was one of those folks who always rolled the bus downtown to work uh, and back. He gave up driving a number of years ago, probably five or six years ago. He, he lives in senior housing behind me here, and he relies on the bus Every, every day to get to the grocery store, uh, to get things he needs, those are essentials. Um, it, it is an aspect of our community that we have not always put a high priority on, but that we need to, because we need to recognize the demographics of independence have changed, and we are a community of, of more and more people who rely on that service. You know, we've got to find ways to continue to seek uh, grant funding, uh, partnerships with uh, with KCATA and, and and other resources to not only support what we've got, but to expand those routes and expand them past five or six in the evening so people can actually realistically use them uh, for transportation to work. Bill Preston. Thank you. I liken the solution to public transportation to the homeless issue you cannot possibly within a municipality solve a homeless problem by driving people into their neighboring communities. Cities depend upon suburbs for workforce. 
obviously they're interrelated, that we're interdependent. It would be a total waste of resources to attempt a, a purely local solution to transportation. People go downtown, people come from downtown out here and back and forth. You obviously have to integrate within the larger community. This is a Kansas City metropolitan area. Independence is a substantial part of that. We're interrelated, we're connected. And the solution works, rests in cooperative effort. And that's what I've spent my life doing, getting people to cooperate even when they didn't even want to, sometimes with the force of law and other times with uh, innovative and thoughtful ideas. But we have to work together with Kansas City and our uh, neighboring communities. We're connected. We need one another. We have to work together. Excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. We're right on the line in terms of time, but I'm going to go ahead and push it and just go for it and get one more question before we get to closing statements. That question goes first to Jared Fears and then to Karen DeLucy. The question is this, Truman, trails, and a lot more. This city has a wealth of assets to attract tourists. Is the city on the right path to take advantage of that, or would you favor doing things differently? Uh, Jared Fears. Um, Jeff, I heard a, at one of the council meetings I was at, I heard a presentation uh, about combining the tourism efforts with the uh, economic development efforts, efforts and um, uh, with the EDC. And, uh, and I think uh, at least we need to look at that as it has a lot of merit to help us combine and um, maximize the, the use of both groups of people to help bring more people to our city. Um, tourism is economic development for independence. Uh, too many people come to independence to see Truman Library, to see the Truman Home, to visit the courthouse, and, uh, and so we, um, we do have opportunity there and to be able to combine those two uh, creates a, a substantial benefit for both parties, I think. Uh, I thought that was a, an excellent presentation. It may not be one we could uh, uh, um, you know, take, whole, take in whole, but we can uh, use that as at least a framework for discussion to be able to uh, tie those two together better than what we're currently doing, which is not really at all. Karen DeLucy, your thoughts? I'm here after 42 years, I guess, due to the history of this town. It has a lot behind us and we're not using our money well at all. First, I do not like that we have somebody else doing our ads, no. We are gonna be discussing it in the next six months, I guarantee you. I had a flyer, I looked at it, I laughed at it, and I called and found out it was a third party sender for $210,000. Okay, that's number one. Jared, I like you very much, but I've already told the EDC, you are not getting our tax money. The tourism income used to be $2 million a year, and that is from the transit tax. And we are the ones who need to use it in our tourism part. The National Frontier Trails building, the one wall is falling down. Um, Bingham Wagner has been, my goodness, robbed so many times I can't even tell it. Um, Vail Mansion, they're working desperately so they don't lose the beautiful top to that building. This is not hard. What's hard is we don't spend the money right when it comes on tourism. Would I ever join EDC? No. Will I try and save the money we've got and use it where it should be used? Absolutely. Thank you. Marcy Gregg, are we on the right track with tourism or should we do something different? <laughs> I think we need to do something different. If we were on the right track, we wouldn't have uh, people scrambling to raise private funds 
uh, to assist with the Vail Mansion. Um, we wouldn't be scrambling for people raising private funds to assist with National Frontier Trail Center and our other assets. I think, I think we can never uh, place too much attention or focus on tourism and specifically on our historic um, assets here in Independence and our history. It, it is part of our economic development. It, it, it should be part of our economic development plan uh, in terms of bringing people to this community who visit here, who spend dollars here, who contribute to the hotel tax. Um, I have to ask myself, when were we most successful in protecting these historic assets and our tourism and promoting that? And I think it was when we had a strong tourism director uh, who was empowered to focus on not only promoting independence, but to look for some creative ways to increase volunteerism at those sites. Uh, and I think we need to get back to that kind of a focus. I think we need, we need to empower a tourism director to think out of the box about, about how we fund these assets long-term, um, how, we, how we utilize existing tax dollars, but also how we might be able to partner with private businesses, large ones hopefully, who might be able to um, sponsor some of our facilities and improvements that need to be made. I just think we need to get creative. I think doing what we've been doing is gonna to continue to get us the result we've had, which is that our assets are falling apart around us. And, and this community is built on its history, its trails, its church history, uh, its Truman history, my goodness. How can we fail Harry Truman in this way? Tourism, Bill Preston. I thank you for the question because it's so important to economic development. There's nothing worse than underutilized assets and resources. Worse than that, uh, being underutilized is just being ignored. Um, I took a serious chewing after a lunch at a local restaurant by someone I love. And he chewed me out because of the dilapidated conditions of Mount Washington. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, it wasn't until Mayor Rimel took me and showed me where Mount Washington was that I know what he was, I was getting, had been chewed out about. It is unthinkable, a national treasure like independence and I mean the entirety of independence is a national treasure. There should be tour buses lined up around the square daily with hundreds and thousands of people every day visiting this treasure. It's unthinkable that we have the Truman Library, the trails, all of this incredible city and we do such a lousy job. And I have to confess, I mean, it's just lousy. Uh, we have to get a tourist director that understands just what this is. This is important. This is a beautiful city. This is a remarkable place. This is, this city has so many assets, it's incredible underutilized, ignored, and permitting, in some cases, to fall into decline. Our, we have an asset beyond belief. We have independence and the whole of it. We need to do a better job. We must do a better job. I yield back. Final thoughts on that from Mr. Huff. Yes, um, I agree with you. Uh, concern here is caring for our historical attractions. About uh, three years ago, there was an estimate of $2.3 million in structure repairs of our, uh, our uh, historic sites there. Um, if we don't do something here before long, we're going to lose this history. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, how are we going to pay for this? Uh, you know, we're going to need some investment here. Uh, I know we batted around quite a bit. Um, We've had a lot of opportunities uh, that's come about that, uh, for instance, the NFL draft 2024 is supposed to be here in Kansas City. We looked at 
maybe doing a satellite out here at the uh, event center, which would bring us some tourism money to kind of help these things out. Um, you know, we're not looking to, for ways to expand tourism. Um, you know, we just got to figure this, how we're, gonna, how we're gonna pay for these things. I mean, it's very, very expensive. I mean, that was three years ago. That's gonna require some investment. And uh, in three years, and that price has probably doubled since then, plus the deter more deterioration. So uh, my biggest thing is, uh, what kind of city do we want? We're going to have to figure this out. It's, uh, you know, everybody, we all know the problems. We're trying to figure out the solutions. And uh, it's always been a, a deal up at City Hall or at, at the council. You know, bring, I bring things forth all the time. Uh, just to get some dialogue going. It's not to make it go one way or the other for people to talk about these things. Um, that's the biggest thing is the communication between the council. Um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, what, what kind of city do you want? So thank you. Okay, Candace, that's a lot of good give and take. Now we're going to move into closing statements. We'll stay with the same order. Uh, it's it's going to be Marcy Gregg will go first and then Bill Preston, et cetera, et cetera. So final two minutes for your closing comments. Marcy Gregg, you're up first. Thank you. Well, as we leave you this evening, I would just like to remind folks that I'm not an unknown quantity. I've served before, and from that service, I've gained a lot of experience that I'll bring back into service should I be elected this spring. Uh, as a lifelong Independence resident, I know this city, and I know its people, and it's a community that, uh, that we have a lot to take pride in. When I served in the first district, we accomplished a lot of really good things. We addressed neighborhood blight. We created revitalization plans throughout the district. We addressed serious infrastructure needs and revitalized our historic Truman district. I championed the development of the city's first inclusive playground and special needs ball field at McCoy Park. Um, and outside of my work in my own district, I was a part of a council that built an arena and expanded economic development around 39th Street. Those were all the successes that we accomplished because we had a council that worked together that valued transparency and authenticity. The experience and passion that I will bring to the city council um, uh, in the integrity that I think I can bring to us uh, it has been evidenced in my past service. I am very excited about the prospect of coming back, bringing that sense of um, working together and, and ethics and authenticity again. I, I think we didn't accomplish everything that I wanted to when I served before on the first district council member seat. And I'm excited to be able to come back to put new and renewed energy and focus into the needs that we have before us and to, uh, to assure the citizens that, that what they see is what they get in me. I'm not somebody I think you'll ever find uh, uh, listed in, in investigations. <laughs> it's not, you know, I'm a person of integrity. I'm not somebody who's going to come in with a goal and agenda all my own. My agenda is to work with other people. And I think we can get a lot accomplished when we do that. Thank you. Bill Preston, closing statement. Let me jump in. I'm not sure we're hearing you, Bill. Is your is your microphone up? Oh. Am I on now? You yeah. are on now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for an incredible set of questions. I have sought to be forthright. I have sought to give answers that would give a window into who I am and why I just might be the right person for this point in time. I think my law enforcement background will have a calming effect at City Hall. I think Peter Poo would recognize that I will not be a party to, nor will I passively ignore when those who have been elected to carry out fiduciary responsibilities on behalf of the city abdicate their responsibility. I can assure you, if you do what you've done, you will get what you've gotten. And I think what everyone has said 
we have to fix City Hall. We have to, once again, return City Hall to the respectable place that it should always be. I think I have that set of skills, both from a point of integrity, industry, and the toughness to do the difficult thing. I love independence. I am grateful for the kind people who embraced me, permitted me to become a part of this community, to serve as president of the Independence Rotary Club, to be a part of the nonprofit community and have served on a number of boards and commissions. This is a great city worthy of great leadership. I pray that what I have presented is worthy of the good people of independence. Thank you. Closing comments, Mike Huff. Yes, uh, we heard a lot of things tonight. Uh, who do you want to trust? Who? Uh, I want to thank the, the chamber for this opportunity and the citizens of the city. Uh, it's been a real privilege to serve all who call Independence home. Uh, two years ago, we had an election. The voters sent a message, change, change. You know what is wrong with our city? Uh, you know, there are the questions out there, how do we fix it? We know we have problems and we know have serious problems, but we need serious answers and uh, that's very important. Moving forward, I will continue to propose ideas and discuss how we can improve our city. I have worked every day on your behalf and interest. I will continue to do so. I love our city as a son of independence. Together, we'll make a difference. Thank you for your trust over the last four years. There's more to, to do to take time for our city to be better tomorrow. Anyway, thank you uh, for your trust and your vote. And once again, who do you trust? Who? Thank you. Closing statement, Jared Fierce. Thank you, Jeff. And, and thanks again to you and the chamber for making this opportunity available. You know, uh, one of the real benefits of working, of, of running for city council is that you get to meet people that you otherwise would never get to know. Uh, you have a chance to visit with a lot of people and see how much they really love independence and want the best for our city. And ultimately, that's why I'm running for city council. I love our city and I want to help make our city a better place to live and work and raise families. As I've talked with people, the consistent message I've heard is that we need to improve. There is a belief that is prevalent among our citizens that they deserve more professionalism from our city council. There's a belief that we can and should operate in a more efficient and a collaborative manner. In short, that we can do better in governing our city. And I believe that or I wouldn't have run. And I believe I can do that. This is not about me, it's about the city. I want to work to see things happen in our city to improve it for our time and for the generations to come. You know, we can work for positive change and we can have a more professional city council. We can put forth a better image and work together so that those in our community and the, for those that are in our community and those that want to do business here. It starts with transparency and honesty and integrity. Those foundations along with my faith, my education and my experience in life will help me in improving the governance of our city. So I humbly ask for your vote next Tuesday on April 5th and on April 5th. Thank you. And the closing, closing statement, Karen DeLuce. Thank you. First off, thank you, Chamber of Commerce, and thank you, Examiner. We all appreciate your hard work on this, so thank you. I want to continue helping the city I love. I want to continue with the legal education I'm pretty good at, my legal experience, which is even better, and all my years of public service. You know, there's 18 years where I was 
talking about NIDs and concrete and sidewalks and lights. And then we had 14 years of planning commission. And then we had eight years of council. I did each one knowing how important it was. This is what I want to happen. Good things. The last seven years, we've seen not so great things. I wanna change it. Let's do it. If I am reelected, I'm gonna continue studying all the issues. I will take a firm interest in the use of the funds and looking at the honest vote. One thing I will not do is transactional voting. That's done quite a bit. I will not do it. I will not change my vote for any other reason than it's a good idea or it's a bad idea. Whichever way I go, you're gonna know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I explain it. I tell people, call me, and people do. I hope I can continue the next four years to make independence the place it should have been a long time ago. Thank you. I want to thank the candidates. Uh, you know, my conception of the newspaper is that it is a place where a good deal of the community's ongoing conversation takes place. And I want to thank the candidates for doing what they do as well, which is going out and knocking on doors and listening to people, continuing that conversation as well. Um, it's a lot of work and it, it helps the community. There is a second Independence Chamber of Commerce Forum Thursday night for the mayoral candidates. It's also at 7 p.m. And again, it will be on the Chamber's Facebook page and then afterward will be posted on YouTube as this one will be. Uh, the primary is Tuesday. Polls in our state are open from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Please exercise your right to vote. Thank you and good night.